The world of Christianity is huge. This isn't very surprising, given that it is the largest religion in the world, but it's still worth reminding ourselves of every now and then. The religion exists in many different forms, uh, different churches and denominations around the world. There is of course the Catholic Church and the Protestant denominations that dominate in Western Europe and America, but also the Eastern Orthodox Church, whose mystical teachings we've covered in previous episodes. But there are also the lesser-known so-called Oriental Orthodox Churches, which are distinct from, but related to, those already mentioned. This includes the Coptic Church in Egypt and the Armenian Apostolic Church, but the largest of the Oriental Orthodox Churches is in fact the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, also known as the Tawahedo Church. Stretching back millennia to the very early days of Christianity, this Christian group is unique in many different ways. They have a liturgical language of their own, their Bible includes books not found in any other of the denominations, and they even claim to be in possession of the actual Ark of the Covenant. So what is the Ethiopian Orthodox Church? What is its history, its practices and dogmas maybe, and what makes it different from other churches and denominations of Christianity? Ethiopia is a land with a lot of history. Known by many names historically, including Kush and Abyssinia, it has been at the center of human culture and development in several significant ways. Some even consider this region to be the original homeland of the human race, not to mention that it is also the birthplace of coffee, which to many is even more significant. But in the more narrow field of religion, the same is true here too. Ethiopia is mentioned in ancient sources, from Egyptian inscriptions to Homer's epic poems and, indeed, in the Bible. Many believe that the so-called Queen of Sheba represents a royal from Ethiopia, and that her meeting with King Solomon in Jerusalem inaugurated the very long history of Judaism and later Christianity in this part of the world. For much of that history, Ethiopia has been almost synonymous with the Church, which has, needless to say, played an enormous role in its history, culture, and identity. The story of the Church begins in the very earliest days of Christianity. There are stories that the apostles of Jesus traveled there and that there were general contact with the wider Roman region. At this time, what is today Ethiopia was part of what is known as the Kingdom of Aksum, a famous and powerful state that lasted for most of the first millennium AD. And it was really in the mid-fourth century that Christianity entered the region properly, when the Aksumite king, Azama, accepted the faith and made it the official religion of the kingdom. This spread of Christianity was also strengthened by an increasing number of missionaries, monks, and other teachers and saints coming to the region and settling there. One of the most significant of these was Frumentius, also known endearingly as Abba Salama, Father of Peace, and Kassate Berhan, the Bringer of Light. Originally from Tyre in modern-day Lebanon, Frumentius was sold as a slave to Ethiopia, where he was eventually freed and then began teaching Christianity. Realizing that the region was ripe for the faith, he eventually traveled to Alexandria in Egypt, studied with Athanasius, and asked for a bishop to be appointed to Ethiopia in order to properly make it part of the wider church. Instead, Athanasius appointed Frumentius himself to bishop and sent him back to Ethiopia, where he became the first patriarch or head of the Ethiopian church, referred to locally as the Abuna, literally meaning Our Father. This started a long-standing relationship that is at the core of not only the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, but the kingdom as a whole. The double authority of the king and Abuna, the former being the secular leader and the latter, of course, the religious, but always in an essential and important relationship. Indeed, both the king and Abuna, for most of history, traced their authority back into the sacred past. In terms of the Abuna, this is obvious, as they see themselves as representing an apostolic religious authority going back to the Apostles of Christ. But for the king, his authority stretches back even further, even to the core stories of the Old Testament. This sacred history is most famously and significantly captured in the Kebra Nagast, the glory of kings, a kind of national epic of Ethiopia that tells the story of the country's direct connection and interaction with the biblical kings and prophets. 
There is disagreement about when this epic was actually written, or at least compiled, with scholars today arguing for a dating in the Middle Ages, in the 13th century. But certainly, the stories contained therein might go back to oral traditions from long before. The Kibra Nagas tells the famous story of the Queen of Sheba, an Ethiopian royal who goes to visit King Solomon in Jerusalem. In this version, the two actually have a son, Menelik, who later returns to Jerusalem as an adult, announces himself to his father, and eventually makes his way back to Ethiopia with the very Ark of the Covenant, the sacred Ark that houses the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. Menelik then becomes the first king of Ethiopia, inaugurating the so-called Solomonic dynasty that basically all kings, for most of history up until very recently, claim to be a part of. The stories told in the Kebra Nagas thus have several important functions. It gives authority to the kings of Ethiopia by connecting them directly with King Solomon. It also explains how the Ark of the Covenant came to be in the possession of the Ethiopian Church, a topic that we will return to. And it also explains the entrance of Judaism into Ethiopia, a fact that is also very important for this wider story. Indeed, Judaism seems to have been present in the kingdom for a long time, and given the fact that the Ethiopians are a Semitic people in terms of language, both in terms of the liturgical language Ge'ez and the majority spoken language called Amharic, this all connects Ethiopia to the wider Semitic biblical stories and lineages in several ways, which becomes very important for their national identity and for the, for the church itself. So the king and the abuna, the patriarch, are at the top of the hierarchy from this time and for most of history. And the story about Frumentius going to Egypt to be appointed bishop is also the beginning of a long tradition. Indeed, from this time forward, all Abunas in Ethiopia were appointed and sent from the church in Egypt, which eventually became the Coptic Church. This is a practice that continued from this time all the way until the 20th century. In fact, the relationship between the Coptic Church and the Ethiopian has been so strong and essential that the latter has sometimes been seen as simply an extension of or a, of a, as a diocese of the church in Egypt. And this also, of course, comes with certain doctrinal factors. So, what are the characteristic teachings that set the Ethiopian Church apart? Well, just like the Coptic Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is a so-called non-Chalcedonian or pre-Chalcedonian Church. What does this mean? To tell you more about the details of this Christological debate, here is the scholar of religion, Dr. Andrew Henry, from the YouTube channel Religion for Breakfast. One of the central theological debates of the early church revolved around the nature of Jesus Christ. He seemed human, as in he was born, he ate food, he needed to sleep, he lived a human life. But at the same time, he also seemed divine. Not only did he work miracles and resurrect from the dead, but according to Christian scripture, he apparently existed with God before creation. So was he truly human, like us in every way, or was his divinity such that it overshadowed his humanity? Explaining exactly how these two natures existed or coexisted sparked intense debate among Christian theologians. Several attempts to answer these questions were eventually deemed heretical by church authorities, and by the 400 CE, debates swirled around two church officials, the bishop Nestorius and the monk Eutyches. Nestorius allegedly taught that Christ had two separate natures, one human and one divine, functioning independently within him. Eutyches allegedly taught that Christ's divine nature absorbed or otherwise overcame his humanity, making his human nature no longer distinct. Now I say allegedly because it's not all that clear if Nestorius or Eutyches taught the theological positions attributed to them. Since most of our information about them come from their theological opponents, what has historically been called Nestorianism and Eutychianism are likely theological strawmen, as in they've probably been unfairly portrayed, but as they say, all is fair in love, war, and Christological debates. Nestorianism had already been condemned in the early 400s as a heresy, then in 448 charges of heresy were leveled against Eutyches, and a council was called to chart a middle path between these positions the Council of Chalcedon. Held in 451 CE, the council framed the official position of Diophysitism, which holds that Jesus has two natures, one fully divine and one fully human, two natures that coexist but their distinctiveness not being lost or confused when unified within Jesus. To quote the Chalcedonian Creed itself, two natures without confusion, change, division, or separation. 
The difference of the natures being in no way destroyed by the union, but rather the distinctive character of each nature being preserved and coming together into one person and one hypostasis. Hypostasis being a technical term meaning a single individual existence or personhood in which the divine and human natures of Christ are united. And we can see Christological debates bubbling under the surface of this creed. The words without confusion and change addresses Eutychianism, and the words without division or separation addresses Nestorianism. This became the orthodox view for much of the Christian world, including the Catholic Church, the various branches of Protestantism, and the Eastern Orthodox Churches. However, some disagreed, and within a few years, anti-Chalcedonian factions formed, especially in Egypt and Syria. Now, they weren't necessarily fans of Eutyches, but they thought the Chalcedonian two-nature formulation was no different from Nestorianism, so they split from the Chalcedonian churches. Historians now call this doctrine Miaphysitism, from the Greek words for one and nature. Historically, they've been called monophysites, but this is not really accurate. Miaphysitism still holds that Jesus is fully divine and fully human, but these are united together in one nature, the nature of God incarnate. This theological position is rooted in the teachings of Cyril, a 5th century theologian and patriarch of Alexandria, who formulated his Christology with this phrase, One incarnate nature of God, the Word. This emphasizes the inseparable unity of Christ's humanity and divinity. When you say God the Word, you emphasize the divinity of Christ. And when you say incarnate, you emphasize the humanity of Christ. Today, this non-Chalcedonian theology is held by the Oriental Orthodox Churches, which includes the Syriac Orthodox Church, the Armenian Apostolic Church, the Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church, and of course, the Coptic Orthodox Church. Back to you, Philip. Dr. Henry's work over on Religion for Breakfast is some of the best religious studies content, period, and it's been a huge inspiration for myself and all my fellow uh, religion tube uh, content creators. So if you're not already subscribed to his channel, um, what are you even doing? Go, go over there, uh, subscribe, and enjoy all the amazing content that he produces. In other words, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, just like the Coptic Church, adhere to a Miaphysite Christology. And they also very much share in the ritual liturgy of the Coptic Church. In fact, this is also the origin of one of the more common names for the Ethiopian Church, which is the Tewahedo Church. This is a term in, in Ge'ez, or a Semitic term, that means to unify, or to sort of something becomes one. Right? You can hear this, if, if you're familiar with Semitic languages, you can hear that this is similar, for example, to the Arabic Tawhid, which is often used to mean monotheism, right? Something that, that is one, right? So uh, this is the meaning of this name, Tawahiro Church. Uh, it refers to this doctrine of the one nature of Christ. With all that said, even though the Tewahedo Church is part of the wider category of Oriental Orthodox or pre-Chalcedonian, it very much has a very unique character that sets it apart from the other forms of Christianity around the world. Despite its close connection with the Coptic Church in Egypt, the Ethiopians have been relatively isolated geographically, for much of history being surrounded by Islamicate polities. Now, partly for this reason, the Christianity that developed here really has a strong distinctness. Just in terms of art and architecture, there is nothing quite like it anywhere else in the world. The iconography and imagery is incredibly beautiful and unique. Just look at this way of depicting the Holy Trinity as three identical persons in an anthropomorphic way that we basically find nowhere else in the world. And Ethiopia is of course very famous for its churches, many of which are carved straight into rock and often underground, like the church complex at Lalibela, a UNESCO World Heritage Site, and an absolutely breathtaking example of Ethiopian church architecture. This church complex is named after the king who is attributed with having built it, King Lalibela, in the 13th century. The story goes that he had a dream where he saw the churches and then built them to fit the dream. The eleven churches of the complex are carved entirely and directly out of the rock and below ground level, giving them a very unique and profound look. It is often mentioned that King Lalibela lived around the same time that Salahedin or Saladin conquered Jerusalem, which made it more difficult for pilgrims to go on the dangerous journey to the holy city. Instead, Lalibela may have functioned as a new local pilgrimage site and a kind of new Jerusalem. So beautiful and striking are these monuments, in fact, that the Portuguese priest Francisco Alvarez, who visited the country in the early 16th century, didn't think people back home were going to believe him when he described them, saying, quote, 
I weary of writing more about these buildings, because it seems to me that I shall not be believed if I write more, because as to what I have already written, they may accuse me of untruth. Another aspect of the Ethiopian church that is very famous and often over-sensationalized is their biblical canon. So, the Bible, as we all know, is a collection of many different books. It's not a single book, it's a collection of many different books. Uh, and different denominations of Christianity will sometimes disagree about which of all these different possible books are actually canon, actually part of the biblical canon, and which count as Apocrypha, for example. So, uh, the standard Protestant Bible have 60, or has 66 books in total, uh, whereas the uh, Catholic canon has 73 books. And this is because the Catholic Bible uh, takes as its, um, as its basis the Septuagint, the Greek translation of the Bible from antiquity, whereas uh, the Protestant one will often be based more on the Masoretic text. Um, so th that's the difference between those two. Now, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church is very unique because it has more books in the Bible than any of these other denominations. In fact, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, their Bible has 81 books, and they furthermore have a much more flexible relationship to the Bible and which texts count as canon, for example. This extended canon includes, most famously, the Book of Enoch, a fascinating text that expands upon certain themes in the Book of Genesis, including the ascension of the patriarch Enoch, the story of the so-called Sons of God, which later becomes the Watchers or the Nephilim, and their connections to the Flood story. This is an apocalyptic text, as in that it appeared in the cultural movement that we call Jewish apocalypticism, and can be felt to be quite mystical in nature. It's also the topic and source of a lot of conspiracy theories and wild speculation on the internet today, sadly. Regardless, this text, among others, is considered canon in the Ethiopian church, setting it apart from basically all other forms of Christianity in the world. The Ethiopian Orthodox Bible is also significant for the fact that it is written entirely in Ge'ez the ancient Semitic language that, because of this, serves as the main liturgical language in the church. Ge'ez is no longer spoken, with Amharic being the majority language today, but it is very historically significant. Coming from the Semitic family, it is related to other languages like Arabic, Aramaic or Syriac, and Hebrew, and has an entirely unique script of its own, giving the Ethiopian Bibles a look unlike any other. We already saw earlier that this Semitic connection also connects the Ethiopians to some degree with uh, the stories in the Old Testament. Uh, the prophets, the kings of the Israelite kingdom, for instance, right? And actually this connects to one of the other very unique aspects of this church, and as actually an aspect that has been criticized by some historically, is that to an observer, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church and their practices and observances can sometimes appear quite Jewish in nature. What does this mean? Well, for one thing, they actually observe the Sabbath on Saturdays, as well as the Lord's Day on Sunday. They also uphold certain dietary laws from the Old Testament that most other Christians don't, including the prohibition of pork. Add to this their connection with the Ark of the Covenant and the strong Semitic character, and you can see why the Church is quite unique in this sense. The scholar John Bin says, quote, the presence of Judaic practices and traditions in Ethiopian religion takes many forms. While the Judaic origin of these is debated, the sheer extent and variety of the features suggests that the Church took shape in a culture which had many connections with the Judaism of the Old Testament. And this also carries over into their churches, which actually have a quite distinct character and layout. Ethiopian churches can come in different forms. There are basilicas, but also, famously as we've talked about, cave churches that have been very popular historically, as well as round church buildings, the latter two being especially unique architectural features of this region. But regardless of the outer shape, the churches tend to have the same symbolic layout on the inside. This becomes especially apparent in the round churches, which are often separated into three distinct spaces. Again, the scholar John Binns explains, quote, At the center is the Maktas, or Holy of Holies, which is surrounded by a solid wall, with three doors leading into it, and into which only priests and deacons are permitted to enter. Around the Maktas is the Qedist, or Holy Place, where those who receive communion stand, and this too is surrounded by a circular wall. 
around the Qadist is another space in which the Dabtara stand, which is called the Qene Mahlet. Sometimes the circle is adapted to become a rectangle, in which case the Maqdas remains at the center but is square, with walls often covered by paintings and surrounded on all four sides by the Qadist. As I'm sure many of you have picked up on, this layout is very reminiscent of the old Israelite temple in Jerusalem, which, while rectangular in shape, contains sections more and more restricted until one reached the inner Holy of Holies, where the Ark of the Covenant stood. And there is more to this particular connection than just the layout itself. In fact, what makes the Tawahedo church sacred is that in the Maqtas, the innermost section, there is a sacred object, the tablet. And what are these? Basically, they are sacred replicas of the Ark of the Covenant and the tablets containing the Ten Commandments. If you remember, the Kibra Nagas tells of how the actual Ark of the Covenant was brought by Menelik I from Jerusalem to Ethiopia. And within the church, it is believed that it still remains there. In fact, it is claimed that the real Ark is housed in the church of Mary of Zion at Aksum. But even if the real Ark is there, every other major church contains replicas of the Ark and the tablets, representing the very presence of God, and are housed in the Maqtas. At some of the major holidays, like Timket, the tablets are brought out of the church, carried by the priest, and decorated beautifully. These tablets thus play a very important role in the church and its rituals. So what are these rituals more specifically? How is Ethiopian Orthodoxy practiced, so to say? And what does the liturgical year look like? At the center of the faith, as for so many of the other churches, is the Divine Liturgy, performed on Sundays and ending with Holy Communion or the Eucharist. This is called the Qedase and involves priests, deacons, debtara, and an elaborate performance of hymns, songs, and prayers, all in the Ge'ez language. If you remember the outline of the round churches described earlier, with the three separate sections, this plays a role in the liturgy too. The most inner section, the Maqdas and the Qadist, are only attended by the clergy, by priests and deacons. Meanwhile, the outer part, the Qene Mahalat, is the responsibility of the Debtara, and where also lay people can go. At the end of the liturgy, the people are given Holy Communion, where the blood and body of Christ are symbolically consumed through bread and wine. The calendar year also has some significant holidays and celebrations. They do celebrate common holidays like Christmas and Easter, but in the case of Christmas, this is not done on December 25th, but rather on January 7th. Two of the most popular and regionally unique holidays for the church are Meskel and Timket. Meskel celebrates the discovery of the True Cross by St. Helena of Constantinople and involves great festivities and the lighting of a bonfire. Timket is probably the most popular holiday in the Ethiopian Orthodox Church. The word Timket means epiphany, and it is a holiday celebrating the epiphany or appearance of the Holy Spirit in the form of a dove during the baptism of Jesus Christ in the Jordan River. During this festival, the tablets, so if you remember the replicas of the tablets of the Ark of the Covenant, are taken out of the churches, wrapped in ornate cloths and carried on the head by priests in a procession in which a huge amount of people will participate. They will then be taken to a nearby river where the water will be blessed. After this, people will often immerse themselves in or sprinkle themselves with the water from the river as a kind of reaffirmation of their baptism. It's a massive community event and very important for the church and for society. Also, the Tewahedo calendar year also has an unusual amount of fast days. Often leading up to a great festival, one is supposed to fast by abstaining from meat, animal products, and sexual activity. In total, there are 250 fast days in a year, and 180 of these are obligatory for lay people. In all these rituals and practices, there is a clear hierarchy of church officials with different functions. We have already mentioned some of them. At the top is, of course, the Abuna, the Patriarch, which until recently was always an Egyptian from the Coptic Church. Then there are, of course, the priests, and below them are the deacons. This is the most basic and general outline, but there are many other functionaries too, from keepers of the tablets and churches and much else. But in Ethiopia, there is also something called the Adeptara. These are individuals who are not officially part of the priesthood or clergy, but have still gone through the arduous studies into the traditions, poetry, and practices of the church. 
They are almost, in other words, like lay priests, as paradoxical as that may sound, and they serve a very important function in society. As we saw, they take part in the wider liturgy of the church, being in charge of singing hymns, but they can also serve as something like scholars who can help people in different ways. Adeptata can be called upon to help with various things, including more esoteric and occult topics like, like exorcisms or to create talismans and amulets to ward off evil spirits. The Adeptata are like walking priests who will travel around the country and helping people with different uh, problems and uh, also take part in, in church ceremonies and things like this. They are a very multifaceted aspect of the society that is basically unique to only this region, but are nonetheless very essential. On a personal level for the individual, the goals and aspirations are pretty standard for a general Christian outlook. To live according to the will of God and to follow Jesus Christ with hope of an eternal afterlife in bliss. Concepts like theosis or divination, which is so common especially in the Eastern Orthodox Church, doesn't seem to be as emphasized, at least not on the surface. The language of uniting with God or of becoming divine is relatively unusual here, even though the theology of the Ge'ez liturgy and text are somewhat understudied. But in an essay from 2022, Callum Samuelson argues that we indeed find indications of theosis in the Ethiopian church, albeit sometimes expressed in a different language than usual. Just listen to this Eucharistic anaphora of St. John's Son of Thunder, quote, As with the mixture of this wine with water, the one cannot be separated from the other. So let thy divinity be united with our humanity, and our humanity with your divinity. And let thy greatness be united with our humility, and our humility with thy greatness. Lord, accept this our offering from us, for a memorial of righteousness before thee. A lot of the evidence for these expressions of personal divinization or uh, mystical experience comes, as it often does, from the monastic setting in particular. In fact, monasticism has played a very important role in the history of the church. Ascetics living in the wilderness or in monasteries have often become saints and serve as key sources of reverence. Every month of the calendar year has days dedicated to certain saints of the church which one celebrates in different ways. The most historically important of these are probably the so-called Nine Saints that arrived in Ethiopia in the 5th and 6th centuries and settled mostly in northern Ethiopia. They had come from various places around the Mediterranean, but quickly became very significant for the spread and popularity of Christianity in the region among the local people. Their way of living set a precedent for how a proper Christian life was led. Uh, the places where they settled often became holy places where people would come to pray, and monasteries were even set up on these locations after the fact. Significantly, some of these early monks and saints are even attributed as being the ones who translated the Bible and other texts into Ge'ez. In other words, the nine saints and others like them are foundational for the Christianization of Ethiopia. Another aspect of the Tewahedo church that any of you who know me at this point will know speaks to me especially is the great prominence and importance of music, not just in the wider culture, but in the very rituals of the church itself. Part of the training and education that people go through to become clergy, or debtara, includes a deep study of what is called zema, which are the hymns and songs associated with the church and the liturgy. And there are a lot of them. It is a very deep and ancient tradition that has many different styles, genres, and variations. It is mostly sung, again, in Ge'ez, and is connected to the wider Semitic tradition of sacred music, but also with a character that is unmistakably Ethiopian. The whole tradition of Zema and Ethiopian liturgic slash traditional music is often traced to a single historic individual, Yared. He was a composer from Aksum who lived in the 6th century and is said to have basically established the whole tradition of music that survives to this day. It really is a key part of the culture, as is the related fascinating tradition of Kene, often improvised poetry that carries several different levels of meaning. This layering of meaning is referred to as semena warq, wax and gold. The outer layer of wax often hides the gold within. As we can see, the Ethiopian Orthodox Church has existed and been an important factor in the region since ancient times, but this doesn't mean that it has been unchallenged. 
In the early modern period, Jesuit priests made their way into the country and did missionary work and also brought some of the most important outside depictions of the country. Eventually, Protestant missionaries also started preaching in Ethiopia and were allowed to do so in certain regions. As such, Protestant forms of Christianity have actually become quite popular in Ethiopia since the 19th century, making up a significant amount of the population. Some statistics have shown that there might be upwards of 20% of the population that adhere to evangelical Protestant churches. Add to that the sizable Muslim population that has existed there since basically the time of the Prophet Muhammad, and who, according to some estimates, make up another 30% of the population, and we can see that Ethiopia is a very religiously diverse country, even though the official church dominates symbolically at least in some ways. The 20th century was, of course, as most of us know, a rather eventful period for Ethiopia. The reign of Haile Selassie dominated a large chunk of it before he was deposed in 1974. And this in fact marked a very significant historical turn. Haile Selassie was, in fact, the last king or emperor in that long line of Solomonic kings that claimed to go back to the Old Testament times and to Menelik I. With him thus ended the long tradition of church-state relationship that had been started in the Aksumite kingdom. Haile Selassie is also significant in a religious sense, of course, since he himself became the very center for an entirely new religious movement, Rastafarianism, which actually see him as a kind of messiah and even as a god incarnate. A topic that is, of course, worthy of an entire episode of its own. Furthermore, it was in 1959 that the Ethiopian Orthodox Church officially became independent of the Coptic Church in Egypt. In other words, from that point, the Abuna or Patriarch of the Church could be an Ethiopian and wasn't appointed from Egypt, which has also significantly impacted things. So, in more ways than one then, the 20th century was a huge moment for the history of the Church and the country of Ethiopia in general, where traditions and institutions that are centuries and even millennia old went through profound changes in the span of just a few decades. Today, the situation is thus quite complicated. The Ethiopian Orthodox Tewahedo Church is still a very important factor in Ethiopian and Eritrean society, although the latter has developed a kind of church of its own. Both in the native country, but also in diaspora communities around the world, the organization of the church is an important identity marker for Ethiopians. It represents the ancient traditions, their connection to sacred history, as well as the social fabric of the people itself. At the same time, as we've seen, Ethiopia has been and remains religiously diverse. Muslims and Christians have lived in this region together for 1500 years, and for most of that history this coexistence has been peaceful. At the same time, the country has now also become the site of new evangelical churches as well as smaller communities like Rastafarianism. But if there's one religious institution that most people associate with the country of Ethiopia, it is after all the Ethiopian Orthodox Church, also known as the Tewahedo Church, and I hope that this episode has at least given you a bit more of an insight into the traditions and history of this church, as well as what makes it unique and different from other churches and denominations of Christianity. It's a long, beautiful, and very fascinating tradition that is very much still alive today. Thank you everyone for watching this video. I want to give a special shout out as always to my patrons over on Patreon who keep this channel going. Uh, none of this will be possible without you, and I really encourage anyone else who, who, who has the, the ability to do so, if you want to support me on Patreon and, and uh, my work here of giving you free educational content on religion, philosophy, history, and all these topics that we cover here. Uh, you can also leave a one-time donation on PayPal, or support by just commenting, liking, and subscribing here on YouTube. Uh, I want to remind you guys also again that I have recently released a song called Graal Stenk with my project Zini. Uh, it's available on Spotify. It's also on my other channel. You can find the music video there. There will be links to that. Uh, my other channel, which is dedicated primarily to music, both my own music, but also to talking about music in a similar way that I talk about religion here. So if you're interested in that, uh, go check out that channel in general and subscribe to that channel. Uh, for now, again, thank you all so much for watching, for being curious, and for wanting to learn things uh, together with me here. Uh, it's an honor to, to, to be part of this community, and I will see you next time.